Mitchell Resnick is a professor of learning research at the MIT Media Lab, where he develops new technologies and activities to engage people, especially children, in creative learning experiences. His research team, called the Lifelong Kindergarten Group, develops the Scratch programming software and online community, the world's largest coding platform for kids. His group also collaborates with the Lego company on the development of new educational ideas and products, including Lego Mindstorms robotics kits. Mitchell co-founded the Computer Clubhouse Project, an international network of 100 after-school centers where youth from low-income communities learn to express themselves creatively with new technologies. Mitchell and the Scratch team have partnered with Google and Google.org to increase youth coding efforts through projects like CS First, Google's CS Curriculum for 9 to 14-year-olds, and Blockly, which makes app development more accessible. On a personal note, I worked with Mitchell to develop Scratch and traveled around the world doing Scratch workshops with children and educators. I remember how exciting it was for kids to build projects, bringing their creations to life, and how enabling and empowering these tools can be for those who might not otherwise have found themselves coding. Working with Mitchell and the Scratch team helped me internalize that coding did not need to be an exclusive skill restricted to engineers, but rather a tool to enable anyone to creatively express themselves or to tackle personally meaningful projects. Mitchell's passion for people, education, and empowerment has inspired me and countless others, and I'm excited to introduce him to speak with you all today. Great, well, thanks so much, Tommy. It's great to be talking here at Google, but as Scratch continues to grow, we're forming stronger and stronger collaboration with Google, as I'll be mentioning in the talk. So it's great to be here and to talk with you and to share some of the work we're doing now and looking ahead to some of the things we're starting to work on, many of the projects in collaboration with people here at Google. Uh, we've had lots of different ways. We've also been very fortunate to be able to have Phil from Google who then come and work with us. I'm here with my colleague, Chempika Fernanda, who we stole from Google twice. She came to work with us and was a student, went back to Google, and then recently came back and started working with us. So there's been lots of flow back and forth of both people and ideas. And it's been great to have the history with Tammy. Uh, so I even went back into the archives and found from when Scratch was launched in 2007, 10 years ago, this was the Scratch team. And you can see myself there, and there's Tammy uh, <laughs> as an MIT. She was finishing up at MIT at the time. I think shortly after this, then started at Google. So it's great to reconnect and uh, be able to have it continue through the years to continue to share ideas. Uh, since Tammy left the Scratch team in 2007, Scratch has continued to grow and grow. It's like, you know, over the last decade, Scratch has really grown where there's a number of people joining the Scratch online community. So this past year, there were 8 million young people who registered in the Scratch online community. And you can just see it's been growing and growing over the years. But I think for us, what's most important is not just the number of people involved, but the creativity expressed by them and the way that's really transforming their lives and the way that that they can you know, create things and express themselves. So I want to start with the story of one of those millions of young people, just to give a sense of what the experience is like for young people when they join the Scratch community. Uh, so this is the story about a young person. Everyone starts with a username. This is someone whose username was Ipsy. And Ipsy described, you know, when Ipsy was growing up, one of their favorite things to do was drawing. And they loved to draw things. And Ipsy got started with Scratch when one of Ipsy's friends explained that Scratch was a way to make your drawings come alive. And that was really intriguing for Ipsy. So Ipsy tried out Scratch, and this was one of the first projects that they worked on in Scratch. And what I like about this is you can see it's Ipsy's drawing, and there's just a little bit of animation. You see the ears are wiggling and the eyes are moving. Uh, and you can almost see here Ipsy starting with something that they're comfortable with and like dipping their toe in the water to try something new. So this is the Scratch programming. You know, for those who haven't seen it with Scratch, you build up programs by stacking together graphical programming blocks. So this is one of Ipsy's first you know, programs and project as a way to start exploring to testing something new. And Ipsy found that they really enjoyed working on these types of projects. 
to start spending more time on Scratch. A little while later, this is a project. You really got Ipsy known in the community. You can see Ipsy's projects got more and more sophisticated. This is a project that Ipsy worked on called Lemonade Time. And in this project, you can use the arrow keys to move the otter. And as the otter moves around, the otter gets tips from different animals uh, that the otter comes across, the bird, the frog. And the goal is to, to be able to get all the ingredients to make lemonade. So you have to get the ideas, of, of, get instructions and, that, and tips on where to get the water, the lemons, the sugar to make lemonade. So Ipsy put this in the online community and it became really popular. So if you go to the online community, you can still see this. This is the page for Lemonade Time. And you can see it was viewed 17,000 times. Uh, it was loved close to 2,000 times. Uh, it was remixed 88 times. Because in Scratch, anybody can take a project and then make modifications to it, changing the images, changing the code. It's all sort of an open source culture around Scratch. Everything that's shared is covered by Creative Commons. So as long as you give credit, you can remix other people's projects. So 88 people made remix projects of Lemonade Time. Nearly 2,000 people, 1,830 people, gave comments, giving suggestions or feedback or encouragement. And you can tell that Ipsy was listening to these comments and reading them carefully. Because if you look in the instructions here, it says, edit, due to popular demand, the otter walks a little faster now. <laughs> so like any good designer, Ipsy's you know, listening to the audience and making changes you know, based on what comes across. A lot of the comments were about Ipsy's artwork. People really liked Ipsy's artwork. And several people said, we'd love to see more of your artwork. Can you, you know, share more of your artwork? So Ipsy started putting up some projects like this one, branded as Ipsy Studio. And it's a collection of different artwork that Ipsy's sharing with the rest of the community. And Ipsy wrote, you can edit them as much as you want, but you must credit me if you use any of these sprites. Sprites are they're the objects in Scratch. And this is something that Ipsy was learning how to be a good member of the online community and sort of understanding this idea of, of sharing under Creative Commons. And this was definitely an evolution for Ipsy, as it is for many members of the community. At first, Ipsy was upset when people were you know, taking their projects and, and, and remixing them or using them in different ways or taking characters, feeling, that's my character. They shouldn't be able to do it. But over time, Ipsy came to recognize that when everyone shares, everyone benefits. And this time that you know, our team, we are in constant communication with people in the community, trying to help people understand this. But it's a constant, uh, sometimes when we say learning how to share is even more difficult than learning how to code. Uh, so that's the real thing that I think a lot of kids are learning. But you know, Ipsy was doing this. But then you know, as it continued to do it, came with all sorts of different things. Here was you know, even a tutorial that Ipsy did showing how to make scrolling backgrounds. You saw in the Lemonade time that the background was scrolling behind the otter character as you move the otter. It's not so easy to make scrolling backgrounds in Scratch. In fact, we're trying to figure out how to make it easier, but it's not so easy. But Ipsy figured out how to do it, and they made this tutorial showing how to do it, and then even commented the code showing people how to do it. This is, again, something that took us by surprise. When we imagined that we would do tutorials and some teachers would do tutorials, what took us by surprise is that so many kids want to do tutorials. So if you go to the Scratch website, there are thousands and thousands of tutorials done by kids, how to do scrolling, you know, how to use variables, how to use the vector paint editor, how to make your projects popular on Scratch. You know, people do tutorials about everything. Uh, so it's a time that we just, people are using the community in so many different ways. So I think you, just by looking at these projects, you can see what Ipsy is taking away from participating in the community. I think you know, what we see is Ipsy is really developing as a creative thinker. And we think that's more important today than ever before. For us, it's not just about learning the coding skills, although clearly, if you look at you know, the scrolling back on Ipsy, is clearly learning some coding skills. But for us, what's most important is that Ipsy is really learning to think creatively. And I think that's more important today than ever before. You know, we live in a world that's changing so quickly that we don't know exactly what skills kids will need in the future as they grow up. But we know they're going to need to be able to come up with creative solutions to the unexpected things they confront, because they will be confronting all sorts of unexpected and new situations. And we think that's what's happening you know, with, with young people like Ipsy. So to try to support that development of creative thinking, we developed Scratch with four guiding principles. Uh, the, we call them the four Ps of creative learning, projects, passion, peers, and play. So with everything we do, whether it's developing Scratch or running a workshop, or giving advice to parents about what toys to get for their kids, we're always guided by thinking about these four Ps, 
because it's a good framework for thinking about how you can really help support creative thinking. So when you, if you look at Scratch, you can see that it really is aligned and guided by these four Ps of creative learning. The first one, projects. We saw Ipsy was just constantly making projects, and the Scratch website is based on projects. It's the core unit of sharing on Scratch. There's 30 million projects that kids have shared. Now, it might seem obvious. If you look at Scratch, you say, well, of course, they're working on projects. But that's not the way most kids learn to code. Go to most coding websites, and kids are given a puzzle or a problem to solve. They get the answer, and then they're moved on to a next puzzle or problem. And again, when I was 10 years old, I would have enjoyed doing that. A lot of kids enjoyed doing it. And you can learn some computational concepts that way. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you really want to develop as a creative thinker, it's not just a matter of learning how to solve a certain puzzle, but being able to, to do a project. And with a project, I mean to start with your own idea, to develop you know, some prototype with it, to show it to others, to experiment with it, to get feedback, to keep revising it, to have a way of expressing your ideas to the world. So with a project, kids, they aren't just developing their thinking, but also developing their voice, so, you know, coming up with an idea and expressing their ideas to the world. So we really try to see Scratch as it's like a type of writing, the same way when you learn to write, it's not just to get a task done, but it's a way of expressing your ideas. We see Scratch the same way as kids work on projects. And the second P of passion, I think we all know that we're all willing to work longer and harder and persist in the face of challenges when we work on something we really care deeply about. Uh, so for us, it's so important to give kids the opportunity to work on things they really care about. So as we were developing Scratch, we wanted to make sure that you could do many different things with it because we know different kids have different interests and different passions, and we want to make sure to align with the interests of all different kids. I mean, some people suggested, well, why don't you do it so you, all you do is to make games. Kids like games. And it's true, a lot of kids like games. But what about kids who don't like games? Then they wouldn't be interested in it. We want to make sure that kids can make games, but they can also make animations and simulations and, and interactive stories. Because different kids have different interests. We want to let all kids build on things they really wanted to want to do. And you can see that in Ipsy's case, you know, where Ipsy was, you know, was, was building upon their interest in drawing and used that as a way to get into coding. With peers, we saw from the beginning that we really wanted to make sure that learning to code was a social experience. That too often when people think of coding, they think of the individual sitting you know, by themselves looking at the screen. And of course, you spend some time doing that. And you know, sometimes that's an important part of the process. We know that a lot of learning happens in collaboration with others. So when we launched Scratch, we launched the online community at the same time integrated with the programming language. And to us, that was really important. And a lot of people, you know, they weren't quite sure what we were doing, because why, why do you have to have an online community with a programming language? But for us, the online community both served as a source of, it was a, it was a, a way to have an audience for what you created, because when you create something, you want to be able to share your ideas with others and get feedback, as we saw Ipsy getting feedback. It also serves as a source of inspiration. You can look at the online community, and you see, again, millions of projects that gives you ideas of what you want to create. So we want to have a way that we have kids connect with each other. They would learn with and from one another, both to get feedback and inspiration from one another. And then finally, play. And I sometimes call play the most misunderstood of the Ps. Because people hear play and they just think, oh, it's about laughing and having fun. And, and there's nothing wrong with laughing and having fun. But we think of play in a different way. We see it almost as an attitude or an approach to the things you're doing. When you have a playful approach, it means you're willing to take risks, to try new things, to test the boundaries, to experiment. Uh, and we want to make sure that was possible. So we've really set up Scratch so it's easy to put things together, take them apart. You can make pro you know, your programs Something like building with Lego bricks. Lego bricks are so tinkerable, and you can play with them, try new things, take it apart, try something else, continually iterate. And we want to make Scratch really easy to iterate so you can keep experimenting. So that's what we did and try to make it. And we also, in moderating the community, to make sure the community is a, a type of place where you feel safe experimenting, trying new things. So these four Ps have guided you know, the things that we're doing. And from this, I think this really underlies you know, how, why Scratch has been growing over the last 10 years. And really has you know, grown you know, beyond what we would have imagined. So last year, there were 200 million unique visitors to Scratch. Now, not all of them were creating projects. About 10%, about 20 million people created projects. But people just visiting and trying out Scratch, it's things, there's about 200 million unique 
visitors. You know, every country in the world, uh, from the beginning, we want to translate to many different languages. So it's easy to make the blocks switch to whatever language you want. And even if you see someone else's project, the project that was done in New York, a child in Tokyo could look at it and switch the blocks to, to Japanese, make a change to it, and a child in Buenos Aires could then change the blocks to Spanish. So it facilitates collaboration by everyone changing it to their own language. 45% uh, female, 100% everything is free. The, the software is free, the community is free. It's also open source. So we've really tried to build it. We, all of the development is done in an open source way where, and we have people helping out. We've been really appreciative. A bunch of people of Google have helped out. We did an initiative last year through Google Serve, and people helped out. We hope as we continue to develop, uh, others helping us out. And every day, there's 150,000 new projects that kids are creating in the Scratch community. Uh, who's creating them? This is a histogram of the ages that people join the community. The peak is at age 12. And this pretty much hits what we'd aimed for. When we developed Scratch, we aimed at age 8 to 16. And that's roughly where you know, the, the bulk of the people are. After Scratch came out, we did another version called Scratch Junior, which is for ages 5 to 7 at the lower end. One thing that took us by surprise is there's more use at the higher end than we imagined. Because even though we designed for 8 to 16, it's getting used in a growing number of introductory computer science courses at universities, uh, sometimes for a whole semester, sometimes just to get, to get started. Like at Harvard, they use it as the first week of the uh, introductory computer science course there, CS50. And they found that when they shifted over to doing Scratch in the beginning, the number of people dropping the course went, went down dramatically especially among women. They used to have huge dropout rates of women. And at least they speculate that with Scratch, people were able to have a success very quickly and get a sense of what's possible and what type of things they might do with Scratch. And then after it, in that course, they do shift to other things. But Scratch serves as a foundation for getting people started. You know, Within the use of Scratch, when it started 10 years ago, a lot of it was being used in homes and after school centers. Right now, the fastest growth is in schools. There's a lot of you know, and that's partly it's, it's, it's a cultural phenomenon that more schools are getting interested in introducing coding. So Scratch is being used in, in many different schools. Here in New York, it, it, it's one of the you know, languages that's really being used, especially in elementary schools, uh, with the, the different efforts. And CS for All efforts is really supporting the use of Scratch going out to schools. I want to give you some sense of how it's being used in schools. So I'll show a few examples of things that we've seen in different schools. The first one's from India. This one was from Bangalore, where this was, a, I think it was a 13-year-old. It was in the science class where they were studying the layers of the Earth. So as the final project, they were making scratch projects about what they learned to share what they learned about the layers of the Earth. So the teacher explained to us that this student, he's speaking his native language of, of Canada, and he's explaining the different layers of the Earth. And everything like, what he was really excited about was the fact that things are moving inside the Earth. So he's explaining things are moving, and you see it gets down to the water table where things are moving and puts in sound effects for the water table. So it's, again, a way of sharing. So this was a case where Scratch was actually introduced at school and everyone was using it. Sometimes kids learn Scratch at home but bring it into school. That's the next example. This is from a, a middle school in the United States where they were studying in a social studies class Rapa, Rapa Nui, or Easter Island, the island off of South America. And this student did something sort of like Sim City, but Sim Rapa Nui. He had learned about the economy and the culture, and you know, fishing is important to the economy. So to survive there, you have to cut down a branch, make a fishing rod, and go fishing. But if you take down too many branches, the god happiness goes down, because there's a certain you know, way that they respect the environment. So it was a way for him to show what he had learned, but also to help other people learn about Rapa Nui. I'll show one more example from elementary school. And this is an elementary school where I really like these examples, where it's used across the curriculum. So this elementary school teacher introduces Scratch and in the same way that if you learn, about, you learn how to write, you use writing in all of your classes, whether it's history or science. You, you use your writing everywhere. They use Scratch everywhere. In this, this is an example from a book report when they read Charlotte's Web that this was one of the students' book reports. And you can see they're using language. You know, they'd read the book, and they're writing about the book. But one thing that caught my attention with this example is notice how the pig gets smaller as it goes further away. So this was also using what they learned in art class about perspective, that to make something look further away, you make it smaller. But then if you look at the code, in order to make it smaller, 
what the student had to do is multiply it by a fraction, multiply the size by a fraction less than one repeatedly to make it smaller and smaller and smaller. So it was learning mathematical ideas while doing that. But again, using mathematical ideas with a purpose. So there's a reason you know, that they knew why they were learning multiplying fractions. Most kids, you're taught multiplying fractions and you think, why am I learning this? Uh, but here, they were learning multiplying fractions for a purpose. They, there was a reason for doing it. They could make good use of it here. Uh, actually, right before this, talk, though, before this talk, I was talking to Max. I was really happy he came. Uh, he was telling me about it. In his third grade, they were making games where they had to show some things about rocks and minerals to let other people learn something they didn't know before about rocks and minerals. So I think that's another sort of great example. Uh, I think it was just recently he was doing that. And that's a way of sort of using Scratch as a way of communicating and sharing with one another. So I think we see more and more of that happening. Um, so in our collaboration with Google, we also are doing a lot aiming at schools you know, with Google's CS First program. It's an after school initiative, but increasingly being focused on schools. So we see that as a great collaboration. And we're really pleased that CS First got started. Uh, they chose Scratch as the primary programming language. So we've worked with them, and it's been great to see the way that they have built all sorts of resources around Scratch. So those types of collaborations are really important for us because we have a relatively small team. We have a language out there, but the CS First team has done a great job of creating all sorts of resources around it and supporting both the mentors and facilitators running these sessions and also developing the materials for kids to use as well. So we're really looking forward to doing that. Let me give one more extended example of one where, and we see this happening a lot, where of someone who starts to learn Scratch in school, but then continues doing things outside of school. And that also makes us really happy. Actually, I was at a, an event in New York City. Actually, it was during CS Ed Week in December. I was down here, and it was this, the CS for All People had an event that I went to. And there, I met a couple high school students. And I was talking to them, and they'd, they weren't using Scratch anymore. They'd used it in elementary and middle school. But what I really liked is they said what they liked about Scratch was they said it was the one thing they did at school they wanted to continue to do on their own after school. And for us, I think everything should be that way. So everything we develop, we try to make it the kids would want to do on their own. And that was the case. So this is another member of the Scratch community. Uh, this is Bubble103 is her username. Um, she's from South Africa, and she first learned about Scratch in school where this is one of the projects, if you go to her website, to the profile, you can see the water cycle, and it shows how you know, the, the, you know, the water from the, from the lake or the ocean goes up and makes a cloud, and then it goes and it rains. So it's talking about the water cycle. But she learned that. She then started making games on her own. There's a fabulous farming game that she made. She made a, pr a presentation about South Africa. She was really proud of South Africa, and she went to share her pride with other people in the community. And she also made tutorials, like Ipsy did, and this one, you know, that you know, Bubble 103 had used variables, and she was excited about what she could do with variables and wanted to share that with others. But the project that really caught our attention and a lot of people's attention was a project that she worked on called Color Divide. And this was a collaborative project that she did with five or six other scratchers that were like in three or four other countries. So they started exchanging ideas in the online community. And Bubble 103 had started this role-playing game with others and then decided to make a trailer for a movie that they wanted to make about color divide. So I'll show you now like a one minute clip, this trailer that they did. This is on five different scratchers working together uh, to put together the, the, the trailer for a color divide. Welcome to Aurora, land of color and magic. Every child at the age of 12 faces the test to determine their magical strength and their color rank. But all is not as it seems. This test means everything to me. I can't fail. What if I don't get a color? I don't want a color anyways. I'm going to fail the test. But, banishment, haven't you ever wondered what's out there? I mean, there's gotta be something. I got close to the gates once, and I saw something, a boy. I hate living in this place. The magicians are dictators. They tore my family apart. They destroyed, they destroyed my home and burned my head. We'll fail this test together. Let's see what you're made of then, shall we? So I think one thing that really struck us with this is the fact, obviously, of the big programming effort. They spent a lot of time doing this. But you can really see that for Bubble 103, 
there was sort of a deep meaning behind this, you know, talking about growing up in South Africa, talking about this color divide and everyone being given a color and being ranked by your color. So we then talked to her, oops, and she says, growing up, I've definitely seen the scars that apartheid has left on my country and the people. I'm really exploring that through the different characters that are part of this story. And again, we, we see this over and over. A lot of the kids are using Scratch, or oftentimes as they go into their teen years, they're exploring things about their own identity, things about the community around them. So you see them tackling issues that are deeply important to them. Uh, of course, there's a lot of things on Scratch. There are you know, funny animations. But it also is an opportunity for kids to really develop you know, their own ideas, to share ideas with others, as, use it as a way to, to sort through important ideas, and also to sort through ways of engaging with the design process and the creative process. So Bubble 103 also said, she said, because of Scratch, I've become more confident to try new things and express myself. I'm more comfortable with taking risks and making mistakes. Now when something goes wrong, I see it as an opportunity to learn something new. And again, that's what we were hoping for with Scratch. When I talked about the importance of play, in our mind, there's a playful approach, a willingness to take risks, a willingness to have things go wrong, and then an ability to try to iterate and, and to, to debug things when things go wrong and to try new things. And that's exactly what she was getting out of this. So really happy when we hear Scratch's talk this way. And she, Bubba 103 also talked about the importance of the online community for her. She said, I've been constantly blown away by the kind of support and collaboration and sharing that happens in the community. That's one of the main things that keeps me coming back to Scratch every day. And we see that over and over, that for a lot of kids, they come to Scratch to create a project. They stay for the community. They connect with other people the way they share with each other, in this case, collaborating with others you know, on, on projects interacting and getting inspired by others. Uh, and I think it's not an accident that this example happens to come from a young woman in the community. Uh, just last night, this is I've my freshest data, just last night one of the graduate students in our group, uh, Shruti Darwal, was talking about showing some of the latest data she was looking at about some gender you know, differences on Scratch. As I mentioned, it's about 45% female, the Scratch population. Uh, one thing we'd already seen was that if you look at the number of projects that people create, the, you know, the boys and girls on Scratch each create roughly the same number of projects. But Shruti was just looking at the data and saw the following as far as on the social side of Scratch. If you like a project, you can give it a love. If you look on the left-hand side here, you see that, that uh, the, the female participants in Scratch are much more likely, they give 50% more loves than others. So on average, each female participant gives 12 loves only eight for male participants. As far as giving comments on other projects, female participants 28, male 16, almost twice. And for me, I found this really striking because we'd already seen in looking at the community that getting social feedback on the community is the most important determinant about whether someone stays on Scratch. So when someone puts up a, a project on Scratch, how quickly they receive some social feedback, a comment or a love, has a huge influence on where they make a second project. So the fact that the young women on Scratch are doing much more commenting and loving really shows the important role they're playing to help continue the people working on Scratch. So it, and it really shows how the creative side and the community side of Scratch really are tightly linked with one another. So this is something that we continue to look at. And I think right now we're sitting on top of this huge trove of data because you know, there's you know, 30 million projects on Scratch. And, you know, we've saved everything, so we're still sorting through to try to learn more about the creative process and the coding process as we sort through this on Scratch. I want to end by giving some examples looking ahead about the next generation of Scratch that we're working on. So we're now working on a third generation of Scratch called Scratch 3.0 that will launch this, this August. Um, the first generation of Scratch that came out in 2007 was a downloadable application that you did lo used locally and then you could share on the website where the community was. If you saw something in the community that looked interesting, you had to download it to see the code and, and play with the code. The second generation of Scratch in 2013 was all in the browser. So you could start authoring in the browser. And that really led to a real growth in Scratch. It really re uh, it made it, it re removed a lot of the friction between creating and sharing. So you could sort of see things in the community, go inside right away, see the right online, See the, see the code, manipulate the code, try different things. So it really opened up to really led to some of the recent growth in Scratch. The third generation we're coming out now, one of the motivations for it is to make it much better suited for mobile. 
you know, back in around 2010 or so, for Scratch, as we started working on Scratch, Scratch 2.0, we made the decision to implement it in Flash, which at the time seemed like a good decision. Uh, right now, it's not looking so good, so we really need to be moving into a new infrastructure. So Scratch 2.0 will be all HTML5 based, It'll be much more designed with mobile in mind. So that's one thing we want to do, and we sort of need to do. But we also want to make it much more of a, a basic a platform that can be extended in all sorts of different ways. And this is something, again, we've been done a lot of collaboration with Google. For the programming language itself, we've been working with the Blockly team and building on the infrastructure of Blockly from here, uh, but then using some of the design ideas we've had from scratch. We've had a great collaboration working together on the new set of blocks that we were using you know, for this. And these blocks, again, are open source, as Blockly has been. So in addition to using these blocks in our Scratch 3.0, we want to have this as a standard you know, grammar for block-based programming that anybody can embed in their own apps or toys or whatever products they have. So we're trying to make this sort of a standard programming grammar for everybody. But then we'll also use it inside our own you know, version of, Scratch, of, of the Scratch 3.0. Another way in which we're extending Scratch and making it more modular is making it much easier to extend Scratch. So in addition to the core capabilities of Scratch, we're having a whole, what we call the extension mechanism to make it easy for people to add new Scratch blocks. So of course, we want to, make, we want to have it so that we can extend Scratch, but we also want to let everybody else extend Scratch as well. So now, this is not necessarily, most kids won't do this, but there's more <laughs> developers can add their own Scratch blocks. And there's a way down here, just in the interface, if you just want to add an extension, you can go down to the bottom left corner, add an extension. Let me give you some examples of how to do it. So I'm actually going to run some things live here from, a, from the prototype of Scratch 3.0. Oh. Sorry, there it is. So this is one, this is using the extension with the micro bit. A lot of you are probably familiar with the micro bit. It's a very low cost interface device. Uh, and so here's the board. It's very, you know, it's signed that it, the BBC helped in developing this and they gave it to every school child in England. It's now spreading the United States. It only costs like, you know, less than $20 to get the board. Uh, and what we're doing now is, so you can put, do something like this. And notice as I, so here it's using the, these extra blocks, and it's just saying this has an accelerometer on it, so when it's tilted, it's both making the flowers spin, and then it has a, should have a little smiley face shows up on here. So you can see the, the code you know, there. So again, we just want to make it easy for anybody. So again, we work with the microbit team, but we want to let anybody who's making new types of hardware be able to extend it. So we're working with the Lego company. So as they add new robotics kits, they'll be using Scratch and just having extensions to that both use the Scratch blocks in their own apps, but also will have extensions in the Scratch 3.0 where you can control your Lego robotics. We're also working on some of our own hardware extensions. So this is one that right now we're calling the Scratch bit. It's in development. Uh, one of the graduate students of the group, Craig Hanning, is working with uh, others, including Andrew Slowinski, who's leading the whole Scratch 3.0 development process, and a bunch of other people on developing the Scratch bit. Do this. So here, actually, let me put this full screen. So hopefully, if I, so this also has an accelerometer, and I'm trying to get the, the balloons and the tacos, and I get different points. I get two points for every taco and one point for every balloon. And if I want things to get out of the way, I think if I cover, I thought there was a horn that sound, but maybe that's not, there it goes. But the idea is trying to make it so that it's very easy to take different types of physical devices you know, like this and to, with different sensors, accelerometers, light sensors, whatever, you know, buttons, knobs, and be able to wirelessly communicate. There's all Bluetooth you know, communication. But in addition to extending it through hardware, we're going to extend things on the uh, either to web-based or, so or, or, or software side. Here's an example that's already in Scratch because the spirit of the type of things we're doing this is one that uses the camera. And notice, oops, should be using the camera. It's not. Oh, did I hit the wrong one? Let me try one more time and see if.
Thank you. So here, you see the minifigs are falling. But where I can do it with my head. And you know, I think a big part of what we end up doing in our group, if we see inside, we can take a look. And this is the, the key block. There are very few new blocks. This one just says, if there's video motion on this sprite, and it's grabbed by the threshold, then do something. So obviously, there's a huge amount of information coming from the camera. I think a big thing what we do is, how can we take all that information put it into the right building blocks to let kids use it in a meaningful way. So we just did it so you see how much motion there is on your sprite. So in this case, if the, if the minifig is falling, it sees motion in the background, it then you know, jumps upwards. Uh, we also have it, you can see what direction it is. So you could, you could also do it by swat in one direction, it could move in one way or the other way. But just a few simple primitives is what we're doing. We're also, in 3.0, we're extending this to do some things with object detection. Uh, let me show one other thing that we're doing. This is one that actually was just got added to the uh, prototype this week. This is one of the ones that we're working with people at Google on to add a translate feature. So here's where I, so these are just some of the extensions to work on now. Some division one is what I was just talking about. Here's a translate one. And notice there's a new block. Let me make it bigger. So basically you can translate a word to any language. Or you could just have it translate to whatever the web browser is set to. So I can make this, and then it would translate things to whatever the, the person using the project, whatever their browser is set to. But if I just set it to a particular language, so I could just you know, say you know, to French, so if I translate French hello, it says bonjour. I can then put it inside a say block to have the cat say. So normally, oops. There's the cat saying hello. But now if I just say translate hello to French for two seconds, now the cat will say bonjour. And if instead of saying to French, I say translate hello to whatever the browser is set to, well, then the cat will talk in whatever language the browser is set to. So these are things we're doing. So the, again, this is a great thing that came out of the collaboration. I'll show one more uh, sort of a fake example, because this isn't actually running the prototype. So it's a little bit of a. Uh, a trick just to show you what we're aiming for. Again, we're working with Google on speech recognition blocks. So as we know that obviously communicating with speech is something that kids are interacting with all the, all, all the time now. But for us, it's really important that kids don't just spend their time feeling it's magical, talking to something, uh, and then it talks back to you. We want kids to feel that they can create things this way. So we want kids to be able to create their own speech interfaces. So we're having some new blocks with on the speech synthesis side, where we'll actually you know, say the words out loud with this synthesized voice, but also do some speech recognition. So like here's one where, if you see the key part here, it says, when I hear what time is it, it'll then speak, it's party time, uh, and then it'll, it'll play a certain sound. So if I say, what time is it? Party time. So again, our real hope is that, again, for let kids be able to create their own type of speech interfaces and conversational interfaces with these blocks. And again, we're still trying to figure out the exact right building blocks. So I think the key thing is making sure that we preserve what's the, the core power uh, of it, but make it simple enough uh, and, and versatile enough that kids are going to be able to use it in many different ways. So just to wrap up, you know, we see lots of ways that Scratch is going to continue to, to, be, for, to, to have Scratch continue to get out to the world. And for us, we really we do want to say there's a new type of fluency. It's something that when we teach kids to write, it's not just so that they can use writing in their jobs, although people do use writing in their jobs, but so that they can express their ideas to the world. And we see Scratch the same way. We want to let all kids grow up feeling they can use the powerful technology of their times in a way that they can express their voice, express their ideas to the world. And to do that, we want to keep on that focus of projects, passion, peers, and play. So there's always many new technologies, whether it's object recognition, speech recognition, speech synthesis. We want to keep integrating new technologies, but always in this framework of providing kids with creative learning experiences and leaving them in control. So it's not that they're just interacting with things, 
but things where they can do it. Because I think that's going to be the key to help kids grow up to become full and active contributors in tomorrow's society. You know, if you want to read more about this, I did just uh, finish a book that was called Lifelong Kindergarten. We used the, the metaphor of kindergarten because I've been really inspired by the way kids learn in kindergarten. The idea of the four Ps came from obs observing kids, and kids in kindergarten. If you think of the classic kindergarten, uh, that uh, kids are building towers with blocks, making pictures with finger paints and crayons. In the process, they learn important ideas. They build a tower. They learn about structure and stability. But even more important, they learn about the creative process. You know, they learn how to put things together, to experiment, to iterate. Uh, too often, when they leave kindergarten, they end up sitting in desks, listening to lectures, filling out worksheets. And that doesn't provide them with the opportunity to continue to develop as creative thinkers. So they really aren't getting prepared for what's needed in today's society. And to make matters worse, uh, you know, a lot of kindergartens today, you go in there and kids are drilling on math flashcards and doing phonics worksheets. Kindergarten is becoming more like the rest of school. And what we want to do, and what I talk about in the book, is to make the rest of school, the rest of life, more like kindergarten. And that really inspired us with Scratch. So from kindergarten, we got the four Ps that inspired Scratch. So the book tells you more about the underlying ideas for Scratch to do it. I may just to end with one final thing. Uh, every year we do have a, an annual dinner in New York City that's organized by the Scratch Foundation. Lisa O'Brien's here is the executive director of the Scratch Foundation that helps, you know, uh, that helps support Scratch. And this year, uh, we, we, we honor two people each year. And this year, one of the two people we're honoring is Maggie Johnson you know, from Google. You know, the, the, the great way that she serves as a champion for so many of these causes. So it's been great collaborating with Maggie and others at Google, and we have you know, such admiration and respect for what she's doing. So we're honoring Maggie along with David Siegel, who's been a great partner. He leads a company here called Two Sigma, but is, again, a great champion for supporting kids and, and, and coding and creative thinking. But anyway, but thank you very much. I'd be happy to take some questions now. Hi there. Thanks so much for the presentation. Very exciting. Uh, I was wondering if you can clarify the associations between Scratch, Blockly, and uh, Code.org, or any other associations we may have heard about, but are a yeah. little confusing, at least to me. Yeah. So here's, uh, I'll go a little bit of history. So Scratch got started around 2007. And there's some other people based on Scratch started working on other blocks-related languages. And in fact, some of the other things that got done then inspired Blockly. Another MIT professor named Hal Abelson spent a, a, a sabbatical at Google, worked with others at Google, and started the Blockly project. Uh, or at least he started App Inventor, where, which was making use of Blockly. So it's sort of using together some of these same block-based programming ideas. But Blockly was being developed separately from Scratch. But it was in the same spirit. As we started work on Scratch 3.0, we decided to join forces, because we saw that each of us could gain from working together. That we had lots of experience of how to make these blocks really uh, work well with kids. So we had a lot more experience working with kids, but the block group had a great experience and great expertise in making a great infrastructure for these blocks-based languages. So we saw we each had something to gain from working with one another. So we've joined forces. So basically, our new version of, of Scratch blocks is building on top of Blockly. So our Scratch things are now on top of Blockly. It's a fork off of Blockly. Blockly continues to be developed, and we're sort of building on top of that and making it specialized, especially for kids. Uh, code.org, which is a separate organization, has a separate site, is focused on getting kids engaged with coding and CS education. They have used Blockly in a lot of their activities. So they've put a lot of activities online uh, of their own, some of which use Blockly. So Blockly gets used by many other sites. Uh, code.org also features many other types of activities by others. So our work with Scratch sometimes will get featured on the code.org site. So code.org is sort of this general site that has their own activities, some of them based on Blockly, but also they feature, especially at CS Ed Week, other coding activities. Hopefully that gave some sense. Thank you. Hi, thanks a lot for being here. Um, my previous job before I was here was as a K-12 math and coding teacher. Yeah. Uh, and I used Scratch in the classroom, but this was right around when 2.0 came out before you had a lot of the classroom management tools that I think you've added yeah. in the past few years. Uh, and I'm just curious, as Scratch moves into a lot of classrooms, as you noted, uh, with CS4 and other programs, I'm curious how you feel about, like, you mentioned the projects on the one hand and sort of the flashcards and the drilling on the other hand. Like, 
How do you feel about Scratch being sort of molded to fit into like a mandatory classroom environment where people are interested yeah. in, you know, defined learning metrics, seeing yeah. progress assessments and things like that? Yeah, that's well, a good question. And I, mean, I do think we want to make sure that as Scratch moves into schools, that what we, what we love most about Scratch doesn't get squeezed out of it. And I think there are ways of doing that. But so I think we're constantly working on and working with educators to feel what are the best ways of introducing Scratch into classrooms and maintaining the spirit of Scratch. One of my former students, who's now a professor at Harvard Graduate School of Education, Karen Brennan, has done a great job of this. She's made a curriculum called the Creative Computing Curriculum Guide that's based on Scratch, but is very, you know, it's showing how to make use of it in classroom settings. So that's one example of how to, of trying to take the Scratch program language, but introduce in a way that we say stays true to the values, but still is aligned with, you know, the needs of classrooms. So there are many, you know, others work on that as well. So I think Scratch and other languages are getting introduced in many different ways. Uh, our hope is, is to try to make sure that it gets out to the world in a way that stays true to those values. But there are tensions there. But I think some of the tensions come about because the things that we care about most, I talked earlier about the importance of helping kids learn to think creatively. It's not easy to get a quantitative measure of how you've advanced in your creative thinking. It's much easier to get a quantitative measure of how often do you use uh, conditional statements. So you can look at someone's projects and see they're using conditionals more and grade them based on that. Uh, we hope that that's not the way kids end up being evaluated, because that'll sort of distort, we think, and what is going to be most important. They'll be learning something that way. It's not to say there's no value in that. But I think we want to make sure that kids continue to have this learning, not just the core computational concepts, but also design strategies and creative ways of thinking. So we're constantly working with educators trying to feel the best way of doing that. It's an ongoing process. I think continue, a lot of people are continuing to work on it. Hi, I have a question about the uh, design of the Scratch language. Um, I think in a lot of other languages, uh, some of those complicated things that you were talking about, like playing audio, might be part of like an SDK or uh, a standard library or something. Whereas uh, in Scratch, maybe it's those are more like keywords or blocks that are built into the language. So I was just wondering what you thought about that. Yeah. Well, we wanted, like, when we started Scratch, we want to have a relatively, we want to make it easy for everyone to have sort of this consistent collection that, that was going to be used. Uh, and we worried that if there are too many different, you know, we, too many different things you had to go and search for different things, it was going to make it more challenging for people to get started. So we tried to figure out what were the core things we thought was most important. And there's 100 or so core blocks in Scratch. And we try to think, what are the things that are going to be most important for the way kids want to express themselves? Before we started Scratch, uh, Tommy had mentioned we, worked, we had developed these network of after-school centers called computer clubhouses for young people in low-income communities. And we saw the kids at these clubhouses, they wanted to create their own interactive stories and games. And they loved manipulating media. But there weren't good tools to let them create their interactive stories and games. So we definitely had them in mind. So we wanted to make sure they were the right primitive building blocks to let you manipulate sound, music, images, you know, photos, make it easy to bring in your own, also to personalize it, to bring in your own voice, to bring in your own song, to bring in your own images. So we put a priority on that to making our core set of things. And we found you could go pretty far with that. As you can see now, we are having these extensions. So we're trying to see how we can keep with that core set, but still make it possible to extend in different ways. There's still challenges that, we're, that we have to think about. Uh, by having an online community, that's one reason we want to keep it consistent. So if you saw something in the online community, it was clear that, that you had all the tools to, to make it. So now, if you see something in the online community that's using the micro bit, but you don't have a micro bit, what does that mean? Is it confusing? So we're trying to figure out how to keep the community uh, done in a way that you could filter out things that aren't relevant for you. So those are still things that we're trying to work through. Uh, you mentioned that you've worked a little bit with Lego and Scratch, and I was wondering if you, know, you guys were working on kind of bringing uh, Scratch to Mindstorms, and you know, if you've thought about the differences between Lego's approach to a programming environment where it's all image-based and you have blocks that are just um, pictures and your approach where you have blocks that have words on them and yeah. are like that. Yeah. And there's also some other differences in the, the, mind, the program language that comes with Mindstorms. 
Uh, it also uses some different just programming paradigms as well. It's not just the visual the icons versus words. It sort of grew out of a data flow tradition rather than a control flow tradition. So there's some differences in some of the ways that the languages are structured. We do, we continue to work closely with Lego. Uh, Legos work on the next generation of Mindstorms. We're working closely with them and trying to you know, influence some of the ways that they'll be doing this in the future. Obviously, we're deeply committed to the Scratch approach. I do see that we're committed to the Scratch approach of the basic grammar, but for Scratch Junior, we do use icons rather than words. And we think in some situations, partly based on age or partly on other factors, we think some of us using the icons can be fine. If people haven't seen on Scratch Junior, we use icons and use it horizontally. You snap blocks together horizontally as opposed to vertically. Because when you're using icons, it makes more sense doing it that way. So we do see a place for both word-based, text-based on the blocks and icons on the blocks uh, based on different situations. So we're working together. In fact, on Scratch 3.0, we're building it all in the same infrastructure. So it'll be easier to switch back and forth between them. And we think there's a role for both based on what age you're aiming for, the type of applications. Uh, can I just follow up? Do you, you have an idea of kind of what that age uh, switchover is between? Yeah. Well, what we chose for, like Scratch Junior, we'd say five to seven. Scratch is eight and up. But it's not that they're hard boundaries. We're also still exploring, I think, on different devices. As we do more things with coding on on mobile phones, we think there might be some advantages. If you're doing small programs on phones, there might be some advantages for all ages, starting with icon-based blocks if you're just doing small programs. If you're doing longer programs, going to text makes more sense. So I think we're still exploring some of the ways to go between them. It's not just age-based. Thank you very much. I just want to be respectful of people's time. It's 1 o'clock now, and I think we're officially done. But Mitchell, you're yeah, I'm happy to, we could just maybe call it in, but I'm happy to stay around. People just come up and talk informally. Maybe that makes sense? Sure. Okay. Thank you again. Okay, thanks.